Law 578, Law of Evidence 2, the topic on Documentary Evidence, Lecture 2. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. In the previous video, I have explained to you basically the meaning of documentary evidence and the scope of documentary evidence. And in this video, I'm going to explain to you uh, the law relating to primary and secondary evidence. If you recall last time when we talked about primary documents, uh, sorry, primary evidence or secondary evidence, so primary evidence basically defined as evidence that can provide you with greater certainty of facts. So in a general meaning, any evidence that can provide you with greater certainty of facts, it can be regarded as primary evidence. Say for example, you have A killed B and you have a knife. This particular knife, which has uh, the fingerprint and DNA of the accused person and the victim, if it is tendered as evidence in the court, you are basically tendering it as a primary evidence. So in the context of documentary evidence, right, section 61, 62, 63 talk about generally primary evidence and documentary evidence. If you refer to section 61, Section 61 says that proof of content of documents. The contents of documents may be proved either by primary or by secondary evidence. Now, Section 61 here mentioned about primary and secondary evidence, and this is in the context of documentary evidence. And Section 62, when you talk about primary evidence, primary evidence means the document itself produced for the inspection of the court. So if you have an original document, basically you have a diary, you produce a diary on the court, the tendering of the diary which is made by the victim is the tendering of a primary evidence and in this context of section 62, it will be the tendering of a primary evidence or a primary document. And section 63 further explains what is secondary evidence. And section 63 basically says that secondary evidence includes A, B, C, D, and E. The situation or circumstances in which documents can be regarded as secondary evidence. Now, so it is very important that if you are to tender evidence in the court, a document in the court, it has either be primary evidence or a documentary evidence. Why is it so? Why is it so important for you to produce either a primary document or secondary document. The reason why we have to tender a primary document or a secondary document is basically number one, to show that the document actually exists. So if you have a photocopy document, there may be situation where there was no original, but it could be a forged document. So when you have a photocopy document here, so the production of the photocopy here does not mean that the original is there because maybe they have been forged, right? So the reason why the, the party want to look at the original document is basically to satisfy themselves that the document actually exists. And remember, the fact that a document exists doesn't mean that the content is true. So the second issue with regards to documentary evidence, if it is produced in the court, you got to show whether the content written in the document there is true or not. So there are two separate issues that you have to bear in mind. Number one, the production of primary or, doc or secondary evidence is basically to show that it exists. However, the truth of the content of that particular document has to be established. And if you look at the notes here, the establishment of the truth of the content is by way of you calling the maker to determine the truth as to the content. And the maker here will have to be cross-examined. Yeah, the, the process of examination chief cross and re-examination has to be made to determine whether the content of that particular document is true or not. And basically, if you refer to the notes here, <coughs> the evidence of handwriting experts and proof of execution, it was properly executed by uh, uh, the party in front of a witness, it was properly executed, it does not mean that the content is true. So execution and content is a two different thing. So if you are to produce an evidence in the court, right, so what happened here is that you're going to tell the court, Yang Arif, I have this one particular document, I wish to produce it in the court and mark it as exhibit, 
if the defendant is not agreeable to the tendering of that particular document, he has to object the document the moment it was intended to be produced in the court. Because failure to object will not going to make him give him the chance to later challenge it. And you cannot appeal on the production of that particular document if you fail to object it the moment it was tendered. So if what happened here, if say for example the plaintiff here is producing a particular document, you objected to it there and then, but the court accepted it, it can be a ground of appeal later if you are going to challenge it during appeal. Now why is it that you have to tender a primary document or secondary document is because con we have to conform with the best evidence rule. So the best evidence rule says that you are tendering the best evidence that the nature of your case allow you to tender and basically best evidence in the context of documentary evidence is a production of the original document. So production of the original document basically shows that the document actually exists. Okay? Now, now let's look at so since it is very important for you to tender a document, either a primary document or secondary document, then there is a need for you to basically know what is primary document and what is secondary document. Now the definition of a primary document or what are primary document is actually explained under section 62 of the Evidence Act. Now let's look at the PowerPoint here for a while. So primary evidence here is where you are tendering the best evidence which affords greater certainty of facts and in the context of documentary evidence, you are producing the original document. That is what actually mentioned under section 62. Yeah, that is the document itself produced for the inspection of the court. And now the general rule as provided for under section 64 is that proof of document by, by primary evidence Document must be proved by primary evidence except in the cases herein after mentioned. So section 64 provides you with the general rule saying that in the event you are to produce a document, you have to produce the primary document and the best will be the original document. If you want to produce a secondary document, for example a certified true copy of a document, you have to account for the absence of the original. So you have to justify why is it that you are not producing an original document? Why are you producing a certified to copy? So it means that you have to account for the absence of the original. All right. So what are primary documents? Section 62 basically explains to you yeah, uh, three situations or three categories of document which can be regarded as a primary document. Now let's look at section 62, explanation 1. Where a document is executed in several parts, each part is primary evidence of the document. Where a document is executed in counterpart, each counterpart being executed by one or some of the parties only, each counterpart is primary evidence as against the party executing it. Now what does it mean by that? Now let's look at Okay, now let's look at uh, the definition of sorry, the definition of uh, sorry, the meaning of uh, primary evidence in under explanation number one. Say, okay, the, there are two parts basically. Yeah? If you have, for example, uh, you have the purchaser. So the purchaser here is purchasing a piece of property from the vendor. So they have the solicitor for the purchaser, right? And they may have the solicitor for the vendor. Okay? In some cases, the vendor may not want to have uh, rep be represented by a lawyer. So uh, the solicitor will be acting uh, sort of on behalf of both of them. Yeah? But of course, the one who is actually appointing the solicitor will be the purchaser. So what happened here is that you have a sale and purchase agreement. Now, normally when uh, a party involved in, the, in a sale transaction, the lawyer will prepare one original copy and prepare another three duplicates. So you have one original and you have duplicate one, duplicate two and duplicate three. 
right? Now, when you look at the definition, the first part, where a document is executed in several parts, each part is a primary evidence of the document, it refers to where a situation where the party basically signed the documents themselves. All of them signed the document. Now, what happened here is that in practice, normally, the solicitor will call the purchaser, the purchaser will sign the document, all four copies of the document here, remember this are document that is all identical, one is the original document, maybe printed from a computer, and the other three documents here are basically photocopied, so they are basically identical document, and the solicitor is calling the purchaser, the purchaser signed the document, yeah, the purchaser signed it, and half an hour later, the victim came to the office and the victim signed it. So basically, all of them are signing on this particular document. So if all of them are executing on this particular document, this particular document number 1, D1, D2, D3 are all primary evidence against each other. So meaning to say that even though 1 is named original, D1 is named document, uh, duplicate 1, duplicate 2, duplicate 3, since all of the documents are signed by all parties, they are all primary documents. So this is actually the first uh, explanation one, the first explanation and the explanation one. The second one will be where the document is executed in counterpart, each counterpart being executed by one or some of the parties only. Each counterpart is primary evidence as against the parties executing it. So if you have, the purchaser have one lawyer, the vendor has one lawyer. So you have S1 here, purchaser's solicitor, and you have S2 here being the vendor solicitor. What would happen here is that, right, the purchaser will sign the document in front of his solicitor. So they are going to sign document 1, two, three, and four. Yeah, so all four documents will be signed by the purchaser in front of solicitor number one here. So the moment they signed it, that particular document will be primary document against the purchaser. However, when they send it to the solicitor, right, with regards to the solicitor here, solicitor two and the vendor here, it is only secondary document in the context of the vendor because the vendor here did not execute it, right? So it's primary document, primary evidence against the person who execute it, but it is only secondary documents for those who are not executing it. But if the vendor here signed a document, then all of them sign the document, then it becomes primary document against each other. So that will be the first, uh, the first part, yeah? If you look at that definition, yeah? So you're talking about... Uh, 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 explanation one, two kinds of a document being executed. Now the second explanation on primary document is where you look at explanation number two. Yeah, Explanation number two where a number of documents are all made by one uniform process as in the case of printing, lithography or photography. It is primary evidence of the content of the rest but where they are all copies of a common original, they are not primary evidence of the contents of the original. Now, what does this mean? How does this reflect? Okay, say for example, so you have in explanation number two, so you have one uh, document. So you have here, W here is the writer of a book, right? She's the writer of a book. Basically, what will happen here is that she will have the manuscript. So this is the original manuscript. And this particular original manuscript is going to be given by the writer to the publisher. Now what happened here, the publisher will do mass production of this particular book. So the publisher, by, look, by using the original manuscript here, produced 1,000 copies of an identical book through the process of, say for example, mass printing. So this is mass production. Now what will happen in this kind of situation, the 1,000 copies that is made through mass production here will be primary evidence against each other. 
So if I am selling my book, so I am selling my book. My book is a is pro pro produced by way of mass production. The book that I sell is actually primary document against another book which was also produced by mass production. Now remember there was a manuscript just now which is the original. So in the context of the mass produ produced copy here, vis a vis the original manuscript here, they become they are not going to be they become the secondary document here. Meaning to say with regards to all the copies which are produced in the same familiar way that is mass production, they are primary evidence, but in the context of the original, they become secondary documents, yeah? Because they, are, they, they cannot become the primary evidence of the original. So that is what it meant by explanation uh, 2 of section 62. So that is also regarded as primary document. Alright, so you have that. Uh, example, documents are made in one uniform process. So all printed copies are primary evidence against each other, but they become secondary evidence against the original. Yeah, this is what I explained just now. Yeah. So how about documents which are executed by carbon copy? So carbon copy documents, say for example, sometimes you go to the shop uh, and you still have it in a manual way. So you have a receipt book, so this is a receipt book, and you have basically the first layer which is num white colour, is the original, the top one is the original, normally they say it to the seller, and then you have second, the page two, right, maybe blue colour, right, blue colour, and you have the third page, page three, maybe red colour. Now. So this, and what happened here is that in between those sheets of paper, you have carbon, yeah, carbon, uh, carbon paper. So the moment the party signed the top page, then the signature will be carbon copied to the second page and to the third page. Now, what is the status of this particular document? So if you have this one, execution of carbon copies document, if the signature is done on the top page here, of course, it is captured by the second and third page. It is done in one, one simultaneous way, being to say that in one action, then these particular documents, all of them are regarded as primary document. So if you have, so the second page will be primary document against the first page. The third page will also be primary document because it is all, the signature comes only once. That is when you sign the top page. So if you have given the top page to the other person and you sign the top page on top of the signature without the carbon copy, then it becomes the secondary document. Yeah. So that is uh, that is the position. So if you look at the 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 notes here. Execution of carbon copies it becomes primary evidence if signature is executed in a uniform process. But if the signature is not done in a uniform process, you sign it at a, at a different time, there's not carbon copy, then it becomes a secondary document. And the third explanation with regards to primary document is where you are producing a computer document. So, under explanation 3, documents produced by computer is regarded as a, a primary document. So what happened here is that if you go to cash deposit machine, yeah, Maybank cash, cash deposit machine, you bank in 100 ringgit and you got a cash deposit machine receipt. The production of the receipt at the CDM machine is actually production of a primary document. And of course, we will discuss later uh, with regards to the validity, relevancy and admissibility of that, whereby compliance to Section 90A will, 90A will become mandatory. Okay? So that is actually primary document. Now, what is secondary document? Secondary documents, if you refer to the notes here, yeah, it will be a document that can be given in the absence of a better evidence which the law requires. So the better evidence will be the original document, primary document. You don't have that. You are producing a secondary document. So production of secondary documents here can only be allowed if the absence of the primary is being accounted for. 
So you basically have the law then. So you cannot simply bring secondary document in the court unless and until you have explained to the court why you don't have the original, right? So the explanation of the scope of secondary evidence, you find it under section 63. So section 63 here says that, right? Uh, section 63, uh, subsection A. Secondary evidence includes certified copies given under the provision herein after contained. So you are talking about certified copy of a document and here cross-reference has to be made to section 76 of the Evidence Act whereby section 76 basically talk about a certified copies of public document. Yeah? After the discussion on primary and uh, secondary document here, we are going to look at the second category of discussion which is primary document and private document. So if you have a, pri a, a public document, so say for example, a government office is producing this particular document, you want to have a copy of that. So if you want to have a copy of that, you cannot get the original public document from the government office. What you do is that they make copy for you and they sign certified true copy. That is the production of certified copy under section 76. It will be regarded as the uh, secondary document. You can also refer to section 77 and of course meaning to say that the production of the public document certified true copy public document here has to be made by public official right and then the moment you have that there will be a presumption by law under section 79 saying that the certified true copy here is uh, is a genuine document because you have to bear in mind the law is slightly relaxed when you are dealing with public document because public document uh, referring to perhaps document produced by the government so you normally cannot get access to the original you cannot have the original it is it will be kept in the government authority or body and what you can get is such a certified true copy and because of the nature of the document even though the certified true copy is produced in the court, it is deemed to be genuine under Section 79 of the Evidence Act. And remember, Section uh, Public Document later when we discuss it, it is an exception to the hearsay rule whereby the content of the uh, public document here, there's no need for you to call the public officials to determine the truth of the content of the public document. It is deemed to be true. Yeah. So, when you look at the definition of secondary evidence here, the certified true copy will be regarded as a secondary document. The second category of uh, documentary evidence is given under section 63, subsection B, where you are dealing with copies made from the original by mechanical process, which in, which in themselves ensure the accuracy of the copy and copies compared to with that. So you have this one, for example, just now, a photocopy machine so if you have a photocopy machine you have an original document so what you did perhaps you have your birth certificate right uh, or you have maybe a sale and purchase agreement you put on top of a photocopy machine the photocopy machine here this is actually a mechanical process uh, and this uh, the uh, uh, this document that is produced by photocopy machine will be regarded as a for, uh, regarded as a secondary document. Yeah, so that will be one. Now under section sixty three, sub B, there you have two parts. Yeah, the first one will be copies made by mechanical process. Right now, let's look at um, okay. So you have section sixty three B. One is where a document is made by mechanical process. This is what you say about a photocopy machine just now. And the other one is where you have an original document which is compared to the copies. So you have original document and it is made compared to the copies. Now what happened here is that say for example... Yeah, say for example, you have one document. Yeah, one document. 
that is the original document so what happened here is that you manually copy it so the copy is done manually the content is the same so what happened here is that the manually copied document still be regarded as secondary document under section 63 subsection B yeah and the third one a copy is made from the uh, sorry this is the C yeah 30, uh, 30, 63 subsection 3 uh, C copies made from or compared with the original so this is the, the comparison of this one will be uh, section 63 subsection C so this is regarded as the, the uh, secondary document all right section 63 uh, subsection D here you are referring to counterparts of document as against a party who did not execute it right just now I have explained to you uh, on the position of uh, 60 let's look at section 60 subsection D you have the counterpart just now remember you have a here sorry uh, you have uh, the seller here and you have the vendor here sorry you have the seller here and you have the buyer here so the buyer signed the document three copies of document and send it to the seller the moment they signed that particular document, sent it to the seller, the seller did not sign it. With, with regards to the seller, it becomes the secondary document because seller did not sign it. Yeah, the one who signed it will be the, the, the purchaser, yeah, the buyer. So that is the position of section 63, subsection D. And E, oral accounts of the content of document given by some person who has himself seen. Now, what is the position of this one here? Say, for example, all right, you have A and B, yeah? So you have A and B, yeah? B is the one who is writing in a document. So B wrote in a document, yeah? B wrote in a document and A basically saw B wrote it and he read it. He basically know the content of this particular document. Now what happened here is that the matters go for trial you are you do not have this particular document so the original document here was not produced yeah the document here was not produced so you do not have the original document it may gone missing so what happened here instead of producing the, or the document you call a here as a witness so a, a here will give an oral evidence in the court he will give evidence under section 60 as to what he perceived and he is giving evidence as to the content of the document which he saw written by B. So the evidence given by A here of the oral account of the document here will be regarded as a secondary evidence on the document, yeah, on the contents of the document. Okay? Okay. Right? So that is the position, yeah? So what you have here, basically, uh, a secondary document under section 63. Now, remember I told you earlier, if you are to produce a document in the court which is secondary document, you have to explain why you do not have the original document, right? And the conditions for you to bring secondary documentary evidence in the court is only if you comply with that under section 65. So section 65 here basically talk about cases in which secondary documents relating so secondary evidence relating to document may be given. So this is a situation where the court allow you to tender a secondary document even though you do not have the original. Yeah, remember as much as possible the court may want to see the original document. Only in this situation allowed by Section 65 will the court allow for the tendering of the secondary documentary evidence. Meaning to say that you are sending maybe a certified copy of a document, all right, a copy made by a mechanical process and so on and so forth. Yeah? So basically under Section 65, subsection 1, yeah, secondary evidence may be given of the existent condition or contents of a document admissible in evidence in the following cases. So, section 65, subsection 1a provides you with three situations. This is where, right, 
The original is shown or appears to be in possession and power of the person who is against you. So you have a situation right? Say for example you have a situation where okay, uh, there is a dispute between the plaintiff here and the defendant here right? All right, the, the plaintiff here requests for the dependent to produce a document. And the document already been given to the defendant. The original document has been given to the defendant. So the, now, it means that the defendant here is having control of that particular document. So in this situation, you have re requested for that particular document, right? And then, the defendant here, perhaps... Uh, uh, do not do not want to allow for the tendering of that particular document. So in this situation, yeah, unless you have proved that you have attempted to you have attempted for the document to be produced, but he refused to produce it, then you may want to get to tender the secondary document. Remember, there must be a notice that have been served under section sixty three for you to tender. Uh, secondary document under section 65. The notice basically says that yeah, please produce this particular document. If you don't produce this particular document, I am going to produce a certified copy of a document. So this is a notice that is given to the other party to tender uh, an original document. If you don't have, if you refuse to tender it, then I am going to produce a secondary document. Okay, so a proper notice has to be given under section 66 of the Evidence Act. Okay, now secondly, the second situation in which you can condition, you can allow for uh, tendering of secondary documents is where when the existence of condition or contents of the original has have been proved to be admitted in writing by a person against whom it is moved right or by his representative in interest so this is a situation where right you already have the document someone has testified in the court with regards to this particular content and you are producing this particular document basically in support this one you have to read it together with section 22 of the evidence act so what happened here is that uh, there, there is an oral evidence and you want to produce this particular document as a secondary evidence just to support the evidence, the oral evidence that has been given. And see, when the original has been destroyed or lost, right, then you want to produce the documentary, the primary document, uh, sorry, the secondary document. Now, what will happen here is that you have the case here, Tan Sri Tan Hian Sin, what happened here is that if you are trying to claim that you have lost the original, what you got to do basically, of course, normally in normal situation, you are going to produce a police report saying that you have lost the original. Say for example, you have, uh, you have your passport, you have lost your passport and you're going to have uh, a new passport being produced uh, by the immigration. What you got to do is that you have to make a police report and to explain why it is missing say for example it has been destroyed by fire or i have been moving out from the house so it has been missing so you have to basically uh, explain why it has been missing and if you have a situation here right uh you have to uh if for example you have a situation where right um, so you have maybe uh, enforcement officer, right, uh, making a search into a premises to look for a document because, okay, you may have, okay, uh, this particular document is very important to show whether you are compliant, you are complying with perhaps statutory requirement of, uh, of inspection. So what happened here is that this particular document has to be produced. Now, if it cannot be produced, the person here who want to rely on that particular document has to prove that they have conducted reasonable search.
there can also be instances yeah right they have conduct a reasonable search to look for this particular document but it cannot be found so if you are going to rely on this particular document right sometimes you have to make you have to provide an uh, effort to reflect that you have been trying to search for this particular document you have gone into the premises look for it but it is just not there then you have to prove by evidence that you have done reasonable search to look for the doc original document or primary document which has been lost so you can have that situation so if it has been lost or destroyed right you have to give evidence that it has been destroyed for you to rely on the secondary document okay and then you look at d when the original is of such a nature as not to be easily movable right so you have a document which are not easily movable so it is actually a document uh, it is documented on a piece of uh, structure or a, a stone yeah it is actually uh, uh, written on a stone so you cannot pick it up what will happen here is that you take photograph of that particular stone you tender the photograph the tender of the photograph which is done by um, which is done by um, maybe comparing with the original there yeah it's a, remember photograph is actually in this context amounting to uh, it can be a, an original printed document but if you have uh, in that situation you copy it down you, you draw it for example then it becomes a tendering of the secondary document because you can't have the original which is actually uh, attached to a particular building for example E, when the original is a public document, so if the original is a public document, CTC will be with the production of uh, secondary document is allowed. Yeah, we have discussed this one just now when we look at section 74. Remember, we read together with section 76, 77 and section 79. Yeah? And F, when the original is a document which is certified copy permitted by the Act. So this is also may fall under... Uh, uh, this one, a uh, public document, you have to read it again together with section 76, 77 and 7, 78, yeah? Or G, when the original consists of numerous accounts of other documents which can conveniently be examined by the court. So what happened here is that you have several documents together. It's a bulk document, it's referring to one another, so it's very inconvenient for the court, then you can produce a certified copy yeah set of prime uh, secondary document okay remember yeah when you produce a primary document or secondary document it can be private document yeah that particular document can be a private document so the production of a primary document here if you want to produce it in the court say for example you want to produce a sale and purchase agreement the production of that particular document, you have to ensure that it has to be a genuine document and it has to be properly executed. So if, it means that if you are producing uh, documents in the court, there is a need for you to ensure the genuineness of the document and then the document has to be properly authenticated. So this is actually required by section 67 where a document is signed or executed by any person, the signature or handwriting of the person must be proved to be his. Right? Say, for example, you have, just now, right? The purchaser is uh, entering into a contract with the seller. Yeah? Say, this is a contract. Say, for example, the contract of uh, a supply of goods. Right? You have uh, the agreement there, signed by the parties. Okay, it may be signed before a witness here. It has to be properly executed. It has to be proved to be genuine by virtue of section 67. Right? The witness here must confirm, yes, this particular document is signed by the purchaser and the seller. Yeah, there can be situation where, right? Uh, uh, there was one situation where you have the seller here so in a sale and purchase transaction there can be a situation like this right the purchaser of the house signed the agreement without it not in in front of the solicitor so what happened here is that maybe the purchaser is a very busy person 
So the solicitor sent the document to him. He signed it at home and gave it back to the solicitor. The solicitor in this contact did not actually see the signature, the signing of the purchaser here. This is not properly uh, executed. The document is not properly executed. The proper execution will be the purchaser will go to the lawyer's firm or via the solicitor go to the purchaser's house and get the purchaser sign it before the solicitor. Then it is only properly executed. Because what happened here, if there is a dispute, be here claiming that I am not the person who signed it. Now, if you don't sign it in front of a solicitor here, then the solicitor basically, kemudian later the solicitor basically signed at the part we're witnessing here, the solicitor here is actually making a false declaration. You did not sign it. You did not actually see the purchaser sign it, but then you, you confirm you are being a witness of the signature. You are basically making a false declaration, right? So what happened here is that you have to be present to see the signature of the person on the document because you may be giving evidence in the court to confirm that you are basically signing it. So basically, proof of authentication, proof of execution can be done by the solicitor if the party signed it in front of the solicitor or if it is not in front of the solicitor, it's a document that there is no witnesses. What happened here? The genuineness of the particular document can be proved by an expert. So right, in this context, you are going to call the expert, the handwriting expert, to look into the genuineness of the handwriting, whether it was your handwriting or your signature or not. So this is to determine on the genuineness and proper execution of that particular document. Right? So if you look at that, this is actually provided for under section 67. It also provides for under section 68. 67 says that proof of signature and handwriting, yeah, so it means that the person who actually saw the person sign the document has to be called to give evidence in the court. So you read section 67 and you read section 68. And there are other uh, proof of execution uh, that is under section 69 up until section 73. Also talk about execution. Okay? So now, so basically what we have just now is actually discussion on what is primary document what is secondary document? Remember, as a general rule, you have to produce a primary document. You cannot produce a secondary document unless you have accounted for the missing of the original or the primary document. Then situation under section 65 allow you to produce secondary document. Right? So this is another illustration of where uh, the, the role, yeah, the, 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 the procedure in which you are to tender the secondary document. Remember, the original has to be relevant and admissible first before you can allow for the secondary document to be tendered. Right? The missing of the original has to be accounted for under Section 65. Then only it can be admitted. And remember, the document has to be genuine, properly executed, properly authenticated. And if you are in, in this context, the document can be tendered even though it is secondary documentary evidence. In court later, whether you want to rely on the content or not, proof of the content, you have to call the maker who made this particular document. Yeah, He can prove the content of that. Yeah, And of course, requirements of the notice is allowed, is required by virtue of Section 66 of the Evidence Act. Okay. Right, this will be uh, some, like, some notes on requirement of the truth of the content of the document. Remember, if you have a document but the maker is not called to verify the content, it becomes a hearsay evidence. That is why the, the maker of a particular document has to be called to prove the content of that particular document. Right? So that's why you have to look at the notes here. Basically, the maker has to be called and the maker must have the maker must either have personal knowledge of the content, right? Or the maker here is the one who recorded the information which is supplied by the person who has the knowledge of that particular information. So basically, the truth as to the content of the particular document can either be made by the maker or by the person who got it from the person who has knowledge of that. So that is a situation where, in a way, you are going 
uh, slightly against the hearsay rule. So there's a slight extension of that which is under section 73A of the Evidence Act. Okay? Alright. All in all, what you've got to bear in mind, be it primary document or be it secondary document, the truth of the content of the document must still be proven in the court. Okay? Alright. So basically, uh, no document can be admitted and marked as exhibit unless and until it is properly proved. It means that you have to prove that it is documentary evidence, it's a primary evidence or documentary or secondary evidence, proper execution, proper authentication, genuine document, then you tender it as evidence in the court, then the court will take it and mark it as exhibit. Right? And if you are not happy with it, you are the other side counsel, you have to object to the tender of the document at that particular time because the objection after that will not going to be of any use. Yeah? And okay, remember proof of document again must be by way of uh, sorry, the, the truth of the content of the particular document is going to be different from the proof of uh, uh, authenticity of a particular document. All right, I think this all in this video which explains the distinction between primary document and secondary document, where the law requires you to tender primary documents as much as possible, and when can you tender a secondary document. In our next discussion, we will look at public document and private document.